welcome to the stage, Julie Halston! Hello there. Yes, it's true, I actually saw that line and it was disgusting. So I've never, ever, ever told this story before. Um, and it's true, of course, which is my tragedy. Um, and you will, you will think poorly of me <laughs> after you hear it. I think poorly of myself, believe me, and I've been in therapy a long time. <clears throat> this uh, story is called The Line. I call it The Line, as in crossing the. So let's talk about what a line is. What is a line? Definition of a line. It's a mark connecting two points, something stretched between two things in mathematics. It's a geometric figure formed by a point moving along in a fixed direction and a reverse direction. What the fuck am I talking about, right? So here, here, here's the thing. It, it's not a math lesson. This is about an emotional 20-year-old girl, me, who got her heart broken and didn't always understand boundaries. Yes, it gets threatening. As the 1980s expression goes, and it was indeed 1980, let's go to the videotape. Although happily, there is no videotape, and thank God, because bad behavior, crazy behavior, was often witnessed by very few people, thank God, or maybe no one at all. I crossed that mark connecting two points in Brooklyn, not far from here, ladies and gentlemen, decades ago. So what was Brooklyn, Brooklyn like decades ago? Well, there were no honey wagons lining the streets. There were no $7 cups of coffee. Rents were a lot cheaper than Manhattan. And there were, in fact, hints of gourmet ice cream that might catch on. But I was living in an Italian neighborhood, and you know, we had gelato, so. Who cared about gourmet ice cream? <laughs> I lived in Carroll Gardens, where English was a second language. And being half Sicilian, I was allowed in. But I was kept in check by the very protective and judgmental eye of all those ladies who sit on the stoop, the mothers and the grandmothers and the widows. And I used to, you know, hear about things from the neighborhood because the, the, the candy store was a bookie joint. The candy was from 1954, no joke. And people disappeared, like all the time. I would see someone and then like a week later, they wouldn't be in the neighborhood. And one time I actually heard two women on my stoop say, uh, uh, oh, Joe, <laughs> Joe's no longer with us. If you know what I mean. And then they'd stare at me. <laughs> I'd back away. So I was a wannabe actress <clears throat> trapped in a day job. And I, I had no connections. I had no elite schooling. I had no training. I was a loser, OK? I was a loser, but I had a lot of supreme optimism, which made me delusional, <laughs> which is really the best kind of loser. <laughs> you know, if you're going to be a loser, you better be delusional because then you really don't know how bad off you are, okay? Um, you may be very seriously depressed or you know, very off balance or in need of therapy or meds or a good internist even, but you don't know it. You just kinda have it. See, all I, I needed was to get back to the man who dumped me. I mean, we were soulmates, you know. <laughs> He was older, he was smarter, he was cute. You know, he wasn't handsome, but he was really sexy. You know those guys? They just gotta look, they just, and they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. Because you know why? They're doing it with everybody. That's why they're so good. Because they're fucking the neighborhood. They better be good, 
because they're doing it all the time. No, no, no. We were soulmates. We were meant to be together. We talked about it a lot. He adored me. He said it all the time. All right, yeah, he was attached. He had children, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, 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 fuck him. Kids. So the first thing you do when you want to get your man back is to stop eating. No, this is what you do. All right, let me talk, can I, no, it's called risk, I'm gonna risk. Anorexia, let's talk about it for a second. Little, little diversionary. Anorexia is a terrible disease, and if you go too far, you will die. But if you don't die, <laughs> So I hung out at that time with my best friend, Helen, who was gorgeous and funny and kind of crazy like me. She didn't eat either. And we thought that we were the coolest chicks in town and God damn it, we were, all right? I mean, could there be anything greater than staying up all weekend, not eating, drinking tons of wine, smoking endless cigarettes and just dishing and disparaging everything and everyone that came across our path, you know? I mean, we were the mean chick BFFs before that silly term was invented. We were the line to be crossed, but don't cross us. So being dumped, we realized, was not just a sin against me. Oh no, no. It was a global assault against every woman. We would spend hours dissecting men and their nefarious motives and, you know, railing against their immaturity and their narcissism. And, and the world was horrible because of men. New York City was crime-ridden and, and, and bankrupt and, and dirty and disgusting because of men, because women would never let it get that far, right? But then, then like, like spellbound schoolgirls in a trance, we would go back back to our captors at the first sign of apology. See, before texting and, and emailing and audio files and all that, do you remember there was this mysterious instrument called the telephone? And there was no way to even know like who was on the other line? Do you remember those days? No, you don't! You're too young! Mysterious instrument of torture and delight and, and you just never knew and, and the voice that you waited for, oh my God, sighing and, and sort of whispering, and very emotional. No, I miss you, baby. Please, can't, can't we try again? Baby. <laughs> there were incantations. They were like magic mojos that had come so many times before. And, oh, I waited and, oh, he's gonna call. He's gonna call. And I waited. Oh, he's gonna call next week. He's waiting an extra week. He's just waiting an extra week. He's gonna call. He didn't call. I just, he's, he's waiting to, he wants to torture me. He's torturing me. He didn't call. He didn't call. This was no longer a charm, it was a hex. And I truly and finally was cut off. So, like a dime store novel that was made into like a Joan Crawford movie, I actually uttered these words in front of my girlfriend. Nobody leaves me, see? It was suddenly 1939, <laughs> and she didn't even laugh. I mean, she should have laughed, right? No, she didn't laugh. I mean, she actually got it. You know, I guess she liked Joan Crawford too, but and maybe it was also because she had a boyfriend 
who had done a little time, see? Her boyfriend was a little bit of a felon, okay? Now, no, it's true, there are little felons and big felons. He was not full-blown mafia, but he was a tiny bit mafia. You know, there were connections and unregistered cars and some accidents. No homicides, mind you, just things that could make Brooklyn in 1980 more livable. <laughs> you wanna see my gun? Helen said, right out of the blue. This could be just the thing you need. My gun. Now, I'm not saying pull the trigger, but that son of a bitch bastard just might need the scare of his life because nobody dumps my friend, see? <laughs> In her vanity drawer, she pulled out a gun. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I had never been in a room with a gun before. I mean, I, I'm sure it was illegal. I'm, I'm sure it was actually fully loaded because she told me that uh, in case of any intruders, I'm ready. <laughs> my heart was honestly in my sinuses at that point. My eyebrows were sweating. I could not believe that I was witnessing this gun. Take it out, it's really pretty, isn't it? It's a girl gun. It was sleek, it was small, and it was pretty. And if it were a prop in a Broadway show, I would have loved it. I would have picked it up, I would have twirled it around, I might have even aimed it, but it was a real, fully loaded gun. I couldn't touch it. She said, when her boyfriend first gave it to her, she didn't like the idea. But now she was happy to have it. Because think about it, Julie. Son of Sam. Son of Sam. And guess what? The neighborhood is changing. And you know what? I don't know where these people are from. Like, I hear them, and I don't know what country they're from. I'm scared. And I'm glad to have the gun. And I think that you should have one, too. So, it's a good idea. It's a good idea to have a gun. <laughs> Take my gun with you over the weekend and see how you like it, because I can always get you one. Because <laughs> that's a good idea, right? So I am just going to take her gun. No, this was insanity. It was crazy. I said, put it away. But you know what? You have another bottle of wine, and you have another pack of cigarettes, and suddenly, it seems reasonable. <laughs> because you know what? Promises were made. Promises were made, and they were broken. A deposit was put down on an apartment for us, and then he took it away. You know what? When promises are made and they're broken, you know what? <laughs> you kind of deserve to die. <laughs> I took the gun. <laughs> to be honest, I don't remember if I drove back or if I took it on the F train. I think I actually took a cab all the way home. <clears throat> but I took that gun. I do remember that my body was literally overtaken, my body, my soul, my mind, by revenge. Did I mention I'm half Sicilian? <laughs> you know, what happens to a person when their countryside is invaded over the centuries? Or if a man dumps you after making a deposit? <laughs> so on a chilly but bright November morning, I waited on a park bench in Brooklyn, not far from here, wearing a long cashmere camel coat with a pretty girl gun in my right packet. And if memory serves me, I even wore a cream-colored ballet. I looked like a movie still. Barbara Stanwyck had nothing on me. And I had a clear view 
of their apartment lobby. And I ran through all the options, right, in my head. Number one, I figured, if he's alone, I'm gonna follow him until I get close enough to stick the gun in his back and I'm gonna bring him to an isolated place and I'm gonna threaten him until he accedes to my demands, which include living with me in a better apartment than I have now, and he pays for the rent. All right, number two, he might be with his wife. All right, if he's with his wife, I'm gonna stick the gun in their backs and tell them not to scream, but to keep walking. I'm gonna bring them to the isolated place. Now, I don't know where this isolated place is, but I'm gonna scare them with death threats, and then I'm gonna make her listen to all the details of our tawdry romance, including all his promises that he broke, and she's gonna be understandably devastated, and she's gonna be so angry, she's gonna leave him and spit in both our faces, and then he's gonna be free to be with me and get the apartment and pay for the rent. <laughs> Number three, the entire family is together. Okay, if that's the case, I'm still gonna threaten all of them. But I'm gonna allow her and the children to escape and then I'm gonna take him to this isolated place where I'm gonna pistol whip him and possibly shoot him in the leg until he agrees to me and accedes to my demands to get the apartment and pay for the rent. And we're gonna tell people that he was a victim of a carjacking because carjackings were very popular in 1980. <laughs> or number four, I shoot him and I face the consequences. The worst, being on the cover of the New York Post in a very bad photo, <laughs> but with a lovely beret. <laughs> Loser actress, lose his mind. All these options were buzzing around in my mind over and over, and I looked for places, you know, to run, exits, I looked for cops, I looked at all the passers-by who were just going about their business on this cold morning, and I had this strange buzzing sound whirling in my head, and oh my God, suddenly out of nowhere, she emerged. The wife, the wife, the wife, and the kids. Oh my God, she's holding their hands and they all look so happy and they're wearing these colorful like knit hats and scarves and gloves and cute boots. Oh my God, they were so cute. And they, they were talking like a mile a minute and they seemed so happy and how could they be so happy when I'm so miserable? Their father dumped me, he deserves to die and I am a gun. I was wrong and, and you people are laughing and skipping and chatting and, and you're acting as if nothing is wrong. I reached into my right pocket and I felt for the gun. And my stomach dropped like a roller coaster. I was so sick. I was so physically ill. What the fuck? <laughs> Who the fuck am I? <laughs> My clarity came with that same strange buzzing sound that was whirling in my head earlier. I was numb, but saved. I don't remember it, but I, I got up and I somehow made my way home and I returned my friend's gun and we never spoke about it again. You know, it's so easy how insanity can come, you know, creeping into your mind. Like, like, a, like a cat burglar on a summer night. I went into therapy and I left Brooklyn. I became an actress who never needed a real gun because we have props! <laughs> the only line crossed was the F train line platform to Manhattan, which carried me to safety across the East. Thank you.